All right, welcome to part two of special relativity. Uh, today we're going to cover chapter 27.5 to 27.8. Um, and this is kind of an odd sort of lecture. Uh, I've got a few things that I want you to do. Uh, the first thing is that I would like you to watch all of these videos um, from University of Melbourne. Uh, they're a really great overview of not only Galilean relativity, but they go into what I'm about to lecture today. Uh, these are great animations, they go at, you know, your own pace, and it's going to give you a really good context for what I'm about to tell you. So watching all five of, of these videos in D2L. Um, the next thing that I recommend that you do is listen to this lecture. And then the last thing that I recommend that you do is read this article about uh, clocks that are just really confusing our understanding of time. Um, that has to do with research out of university of Colorado Boulder. I will talk about that a little bit more briefly. Um, last class we discussed how space and time are related and we believe both of those things to be influenced by gravity and we're finding experimental ev evidence that there is such. Um, but if you imagine uh, space-time as being this kind of fabric, uh, perhaps like a woven fabric as you can see with this grid work, um, each line would maybe represent a thread um, if I put a very heavy object or a very massive object on that fabric, well, then it's going to kind of spread out and, and stretch out the threads around it. Um, thus, it takes longer for me to get to the next second if I'm right by that heavy object, or it, it takes longer for me to measure that distance, right? Because, well, those fibers are spread, spread out. But if I'm away from the influence of that gravity, then it's much, much shorter for me to get to a second and much, much shorter for me to measure that distance. So we begin to see from this model and this idea of space-time stretching that our conception of time on Earth is actually very, very skewed from time and distance in the rest of the universe. The research at UC Boulder, that article that I'm telling you to read, is really interesting because it's measuring these gravitational differences at different elevations throughout the Earth and how that influences um, our perception of time. All right, so I'm going to take a second and go back and kind of review the three main principles behind Einstein's theory of special relativity. Uh, the first and foremost is that all laws of physics are the same in all internal reference frames. This includes um, Galilean transformations and Newtonian physics about motion and momentum and energy and all of those things. Uh, but then it also goes on to include beyond what Galileo included, which is electromagnetic science and this, the idea out of Maxwell's equations that light travels at the same speed no matter where you're at. And Einstein said it travels at the same speed no matter how you're moving, which is kind of interesting and prevents a few conceptual problems for us. And then the last principle is that the effects of relativity are large only for objects moving at relativistic speeds. And so this is the last thing that makes special relativity really difficult for us is that we as humans really have no concept of relativistic speeds, things approaching the speed of light. Uh, and so we've got to use math to try and understand the effects of moving at those speeds. Um, I'm going to focus on that second principle, that light moves at the same speed no matter where you're at. Uh, Maxwell proved this with one of his equations, many equations on electromagnetic waves. And for us as humans, this is difficult to understand because we want to think of a wave as like an ocean wave as, or maybe a sound wave as traveling through matter, something that I can get through uh, faster or quicker depending on how fast I'm traveling. And so one of your homework problems from the last uh, lecture had to do with light leaving a lighthouse and traveling towards a boat that was moving at relativistic speeds. And it said, well, if you're standing in the lighthouse, how fast is that light moving? Well, it's moving away from you at the speed of light. But then imagining that the sailboat is approaching the lighthouse at like, I don't know, maybe like half the speed of light, uh, 0 0.5 C. You want to say that it is experiencing those light waves faster than the speed of light because it's kind of going into them. And that's that's an incorrect perception of you imagining light as matter. It's not. Um, light is traveling at the same speed no matter where you're at. And so that sailboat receives light also at the speed of light no matter what speed it is traveling. And so we're going to explore today 
a few of the consequences of that. Um, one of the hardest parts of this is that to us, light is time. And, and this is a really strange thing. So to us, uh, Pluto is about 75 trillion or 7.5 trillion kilometers from Earth. And so we imagine this as light taking a time to travel a distance that great. And so um, let's figure out how long it does take for light to travel to Pluto. So our first major conversion is getting this kilometers number down to an SI unit of meters, and we find that it's 7.5 times 10 to the 12th meters from Earth to Pluto. We then take that number in meters and divide by the speed of light as 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per one second. And doing that is going to cancel out my meters, and I'll find that it's 2.5 times 10 to the fourth seconds for light to get to Pluto. But that's not really useful because, well, that's a lot of seconds. And so let's say that I want to transform that to hours. Um, I know that there are 3,600 seconds in one hour. And then I find that it takes light 6.9 hours to get to Earth. Uh, from Earth to Pluto or from Pluto to Earth to tra travel that great distance. And so at night when you look into a telescope and you're looking at Pluto, let's say you've got a very, very powerful telescope, um, you're looking at the events from Pluto uh, approximately seven hours in the past. right? And while this might not be a lot for our little galaxy, uh, for the entirety of the universe, if we are receiving light from very, very distant stars, say 25 light years away, then we are receiving the light that left those stars 25 years ago. And so we are, in essence, looking into the past. Um, and likewise for anyone that may be looking at Earth. We can look at this duality on a smaller scale as well. Um, a useful conversion to know an alternate speed of light is that light travels 300 meters every um, one there we go microsecond and so let's imagine that I am standing somewhere next to a tree and I'm very unfortunate because I get uh, lightning striking that tree and then uh, 200 nanoseconds later I see a lightning strike at uh, what my very perceptive eyes know is 600 meters away well the actuality of that is that even though I observed the second lightning strike after the first one, well, it took two microseconds for the light to even get to me. And so the actual event of this lightning strike, the first one on the tree, and the second one 600 meters away, they actually happened at the same time. I just observed them to be at different times because of the different distances and the amount of time that it takes light to travel those distances. We then begin to consider um, time dilation. And so uh, time dilation actually has a formula, a quantitative value that we will play with in class. And so these are some uh, noteworthy notes that the observed time of something moving at relativistic speeds um, is, is divided by 1 minus the fraction of the speed of light squared. But I want to look at this conceptually in the purposes of this lecture. And so as it was explained to you in the physics website, um, we're going to imagine that we've got two people in internal reference frames. Uh, we've got Zoe up here who is in a speed of light car that can travel at relativistic speeds. And inside Zoe's car is essentially this clock. And this clock is operated by a laser beam that bounces between two mirrors traveling at the speed of light. And remember, the speed of light is simply the speed of light because Zoe is in an internal reference frame traveling at a constant velocity. But then we also have Jasper. And let's say Jasper is on this balcony and he's going to watch Zoe's car with this clock in it go by. And uh, Jasper's time is also moving at the speed of light. Um, but what's going to happen is that Jasper is going to observe Zoe's time to be different than Zoe observes Zoe's time. All right, so we've got uh, Zoe, whose car on the left is about to go, and Jasper, who is stationary on some kind of balcony watching Zoe go by at relativistic speeds. Um, and we're going to first consider this situation from Zoe's perspective. Uh, from Zoe's perspective, 
she simply goes by she sees Jasper moving by because well she feels like she's stationary moving at a constant velocity and um, let's see to her her clock just ticks back and forth like normal right um, however to Jasper it's going to appear a little bit different so for Jasper as Zoe goes by um, her clock appears to move and the reception of the light beam from the top to the bottom mirror is a little bit differently and so Jasper observes Zoe's time to move more slowly. So here I've got Jasper and Zoe's version of these events side by side. We've got Jasper, uh, Jasper's version on the top and Zoe's version on the bottom and what I want you to pay special attention to is the number of clock ticks that each one of them observes and so I'm going to play this in slow motion. Zoe's car begins to move. Jasper observes a greater distance and thus a greater time for one tick. Um, in the time that Jasper observes two ticks, Zoe has observed four ticks of her clock. Right? And so because Zoe is moving at relativistic speeds, Jasper here on the outside um, sees that clock moving more slowly and Zoe observes time to move as it normally does. And so when we look at this time dilation formula, uh, we've got this delta tau on the top, and delta tau is the time observed in the reference frame which has the clock moving at a relative speed of zero meters per second. And so it's the time observed in the reference frame that also holds the clock. And so for the uh, Zoe and Jasper situation, this delta tau would be the time for Zoe in her car with the clock, but then the time that Jasper observes would be this regular delta t, um, and this b would be the fraction of the speed of light that Zoe is going, and so if Zoe is going 50% of the speed of light, then this beta value will be 0 0.5 squared. If, say, Zoe is going uh, 10 light years, is going to travel for 10 light years, light years away and Zoe is traveling at a speed of 0.8 um, light years per year or um, point oh that point didn't show up 0 0.8 point eight there we go um, at 80% of the speed of light then Jasper is going to observe that trip to take uh, 10 divided by 0.8 which is going to be like 12 point something. It's going to be 12.5 years in Jasper time because this light year and this light year is going to cancel and we're going to wind up with just years. And so this winds up with some really interesting implications. Um, there's this notion called the twin paradox, which you can read more about on page 903 of your book. So this is page 903 of your book and the twin paradox imagines that we have um, two twins and one of those twins is going to explore space travel and at the time of their departure obviously they're the same age they're twins they were born at the same time on earth and so um, one twin let's let's maybe call this guy Harry is going to travel at the speed of light and then Ben is going to stay on earth and um, as Harry travels at the speed of light, Ben observes Harry's time to move more slowly. And because Harry has an acceleration and a deceleration, um, Harry is not in an internal reference frame. And so when Harry comes back, Ben's ob observations are true, that the trip seems to take much longer for Ben, who is aged many, many years, uh, but because time went more slowly for Harry, when he returns, he is much younger than his twin. Um, this is actually observably possible. We have taken um, very fast fighter jets way, way up into the atmosphere with very precise clocks and let them go around for a very long time. And when they return, we notice just barely observable differences that they were like 0 0.002 microseconds um, behind the clocks that had been left on Earth. And so their time moved more slowly, even just within our atmosphere. And this is currently what UC Boulder is, is seeing. Um, 
because of this too, and, and this is kind of heartbreaking for all those sci-fi fans out there, um, we can really only travel, as Harry did, into the future. We can never travel into the past because no matter how fast we're going, time still moves forward, right? Um, even if it's incredibly slow because I'm moving at a very, very fast fraction of the speed of light, um, time is still going forward. And so we can never travel into the past. If we travel far enough out in space and then we stop, we can observe the events of the past, but we can never influence those events of the past. Um, the other funny consequence of moving at relativistic speeds is this idea of length contraction. So not only does time seem to pass more slowly for someone moving at relativistic speeds to an outside observer, um, the length of things also seems to contract. And so um, in this whole Harry Ben situation, a Ben is going to observe Harry's spaceship to be actually really, really small. And if you're a Star Wars fan, you know that, or even a Star Trek, I think they allude to this, that things tend to appear smaller when they are moving faster. Um, again, this funny L is going to be the length of whatever the spaceship, um, whatever reference frame is holding the clock at a velocity of zero. And so in this case, this is going to be um, Harry's spaceship. And then L is going to be the observed length for an outside person. Um, and so we can we can actually observe things to be physically smaller when they are moving very quickly. Um, ultimately, there are two big consequences of moving at relativistic speeds. Um, if I have an outside observer, say on planet Earth, um, their time is going to move a little bit faster and their rulers are going to be a little bit longer. Um, however, if I then put that person in a spaceship that is moving very, very fast at some fraction of the speed of light, um, then their rulers are going to be shorter and their clocks are going to be slower. And so this really messes up our whole idea of, of physics in that there is an absolute distance and there is an absolute time that's completely untrue. Um, it is all relative to the speed at which you are moving. And so the last kind of thing that I'm going to throw at you because I've, I've now told you that length and time aren't real, they're only constructions of your perception based on where you're at in our universe. Um, those are still valid because you're probably going to be on Earth uh, traveling at the speed you are for most of your life, so it's okay. You can still use those, but know that on a cosmic scale, this is not necessarily the case. Um, the last thing that we need to do is go back and revise our notion of Galilean relativity, um, and these are known as Lorentz's transformations. There's two of them, and Lorentz's transformations, as you can see, are very, very similar to the Galilean transformations of relativistic motion. Um, that is the thing, same thing we started this chapter on of two cars traveling at different speeds in the same direction and their perceived or their relative motion is a, is a subtraction of the speeds. Um, and then if those two cars are going towards each other, this is the same thing, um, but it considers relativistic motion now. Um, U is still the velocity of whatever in reference frame s and then u prime is the velocity of whatever in s prime v is the relative velocity between those objects and c is the speed of light and so this is just a more um appropriate at this point transformation of relative motion and on that note i'm going to give you your homework problems i would like you to go ahead and start attempting these beginning conceptual ones, 7, 8, and 10. And then we in class will do uh, 11, 13, 15, and 16, as well as your quantitative problems. All right, hope you are still happy that time and length are no longer what you thought. But that's okay, we'll practice in class and we'll, we'll get this working for you.